welcome to The Wheel of Mind. Uh, this is a character point of view reread podcast dedicated to Robert Jordan's The Wheel of Time series. This season, we're taking a deep dive into Moiraine's POV to kick off our show. Uh, I'm Lajar Dane of The White Aja. And I'm Giskel Samaris, a scholar from Ilian. We'd like to remind all of our listeners that this is a reread podcast, so we will potentially spoil anything and everything from all 15 books. Uh, today, we're here to discuss chapters eight and nine from New Spring. Uh, Lajar, would you mind starting us off with your synopsis of chapter eight? Sure, thanks. Chapter eight is called Shreds of Serenity. Although accepted have been assigned to this new census work that we've been uh, hearing about for several chapters now, and Moiraine is further being hounded by Aes Sedai trying to put her on the sun throne, Moiraine and Suwan are not released from their private classes with full sisters. Accepted don't have to teach their novice classes currently, but full sisters do, and they're not happy about it. The novelty of this new census task really seems to have worn off for just about everyone, and divisions in tower politics appear to be deepening because of it. Speaking of those accepted uh, one-on-one classes with sisters, what do they actually study in there? Well, we've got a dose of history, philosophy, and law. It kind of depends on the sisters' aja and specialty, it sounds like. Moraine has been finished with her lessons with the power for a while, so all of her remaining lessons are more academic than practical. As usual, Moraine is impatient to leave the tower and find the dragon, but it doesn't seem like anybody has been out physically searching for him. Any of the sisters um, who had those secret messages being sent to them and that type of thing, and that really bothers Moraine. Moraine actually flat out asks all of her Aes Sedai teachers about the rumors she's been hearing about the war, namely that many parts of the coalition have already packed up to go home or they're about to. This obviously concerns Moraine because it might be a lot harder to find the dragon and his mother because a lot of these people are leaving potentially before they can count them. All the sisters do is redirect her to their lessons or in the case of Aisha, threaten to send her to Mirion for a switching. All Moraine can think of is how she wants to gain the shawl right away so that she can leave the tower and start the search. There are even more rumors flying around, one of them being that Gitara foretold that Tarman Gaidon, the last battle, would occur during the lifetimes of sisters currently living. Suwan doesn't really see why that matters, as they already knew from her final dragon foretelling that they heard in Chapter 2 that the last battle must be imminent, but Moiraine thinks that there must have been other foretellings leading up to that one, which would be why Tamara was so sure of what was happening and when. And the foretelling we know can manifest differently in different women. So we actually don't know that Gitara didn't mean he was being born right that instant. So far, we've been assuming that it's going to be at some point within about 10 days uh, in the future of that foretelling. Suwan doesn't think that this really matters. She doesn't really want to talk about it anymore. So they go back to the accepted quarters so Moiraine can practice the test for the weaves like we saw in our previous episode. Morel and Suwan are bugging Moraine as usual, but then someone else bursts through their door because, again, they are apparently not allowed to lock their doors. Right. Elida simply watches at first, and Moraine only makes it to 62 out of the 100 required weaves before she falters. Elida expresses her strong desire to see Moraine pass the test and shows contempt for how accepted these days practice. These days, even though I think it's not been that long since Elida herself attained the shawl, but whatever. She starts her best to, quote, test Moraine, which includes really loud noises. I mean, like screaming whistles in her ears, flashes of light before her eyes, and the worst of all being hard physical strikes with flows of air. We have seen something like this in the past with little pinches or tiny swats here and there, but this is straight up beating her. So Moraine only makes it through about 12 of the weaves before she fumbles, and Elida makes her start over and over again until Moraine can only make it through about three. Then she turns and does the same thing to Suwan, who defiantly does not cry until Elida leaves. The Red Sister comes to heal them in the morning and test them again in the evening. This process repeats for a couple of nights, and uh, Mirella and the other accepted soothe the women's hurts and bruises with ointment every night. Apparently, someone went and told the mistress of novices, Mirion, who says that Elida is in trouble, not for physically hurting them, but for helping them to cheat on the test, maybe. It wasn't clear whether that was outright cheating or not. Elida was apparently humiliated. We don't get any more details on what that means, but it sounds like 
a light punishment to me. Um, Miriam asked them to, quote, accept her gift in the spirit it was given. Moiraine starts to kind of inwardly spiral about how hard the test must be. If this, if these beatings were borderline cheating for it, how horrible is the test going to be? She never even got close to the hundredth weave in any of those trials. So she pushed Morella and Sawan to be harder on her, but she still is only getting about two thirds of the way through most of the time, just like she was before Elida showed up. They also have to fear retaliation from Elida now. They didn't like her before and there was this mutual dislike, but um, she's certainly an outright enemy for now. Suwan does not seem at least outwardly as ruffled by this. She said, well, I wasn't going to be her friend anyway. Um, and also feeling confident that soon, once they attain the shawl, they'll be powerful enough to defend themselves or retaliate on their own. Moraine thinks this is pretty funny because sisters don't go around hurting each other. And um, watch out for some foreshadowing there. Ouch, that kind of hurts to hear this. <laughs> yes. Um, and then the, the chapter ends with spring arriving. We see the number of potential dragon candidate names on the census dwindling and dwindling. And Moraine only hopes that the mother will be one who actually gave enough details for them to find her. Then Moraine gets summoned for her shawl test and thus ends chapter eight. Right. So what we have here is a chapter without a lot of backstory, like some have had, because the chapters seem to have either been backstory or action. Mm -hmm. And this one is without a lot of backstory, without a lot of action, but with so much suspense and so much depth to it. Mm -hmm. um, this, this is a wonderful chapter to read when, when you're going through and, and kind of nitpicking as we do looking at details and, and seeing what all it contains. I, I love this one. Um, you know, how I love to find pull quotes. So uh, this is one I, I pulled out at the beginning when the Sadai are having to teach classes rather than the accepted. You know, they're, they're having to teach novice classes and things that, that uh, they felt like they were above. And the pull quote is, in the depths of winter's cold, the towers seemed feverish. So even the Sadai calm can only take you so far when people are really irritated. Um, I don't think it's outright anger at this point, but but irritation, mm -hmm. and uh, they they were just not able to keep that out of their demeanor the the way that you tend to expect Sadai to be. Of course, they're in the tower. Um, I I believe in the tower, they can so to speak here let their hair down if you don't mind me using a Mirandian expression. <laughs> yeah, they they can relax a little more and be themselves a little more. Where I believe in in a public place uh, outside the tower they would be unruffled by anything mm -hmm. because that's that's part of the the sdi image that's part of the branding if you would of who they are but here in the tower they they can be themselves a little more and they can show it a little bit when their when their feathers are ruffled um where they, where they wouldn't otherwise that's a great point a lot of how we see i said i in at least earlier on in the main series is outside of the tower. And so not only are we seeing outside of their perspectives and not in their heads, like we are here uh, with Moraine, but they're outside of the tower where they need to maintain that air of kind of mystique. And yes. uh, you, you never need to be exactly sure what I said I can or can't do. They don't always go around telling everyone that they're, at least Moraine doesn't go around telling everyone yeah. that she's not allowed to hurt people with the power and that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think they like the air of mystery that surrounds them. There are some people who know quite a bit about the tower. They may know about the three oaths and what constrains the sisters, but just your every or everyday ordinary person doesn't know that. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, in some places where they're referred to as the witches of Tarvalon, they're not not thought favorably of. People, I think, start all kinds of rumors about what some did or one did. Or to some people, they become the boogeyman to scare little children. Mm -hmm. And I think personally, they don't mind feeding into this. They they don't mind not painting themselves this way, but allowing others to paint them this way, because it does lend still to their authority. That's that's a really great point. I was thinking about that probably even the first time I read The Eye of the World when uh, we hear a lot of sort of prejudice against Aes Sedai from yeah. the Two Rivers people. And uh, then we meet White Cloaks who have this extreme zeal against them. And then we see Moiraine doing a lot of things that don't tend to improve that image any to the people who don't know about Aes Sedai. 
she you, summons that whirlpool to sink the fairy at the uh, Terran fairy. And uh, she intimidates the white cloaks by, you know, making herself look giant and stepping over the walls, uh, in the city walls in Berlon. So she's not doing anything to improve kind of the PR of Aes Sedai. And that bothered me at first. I thought, is that just Moraine being single-minded and being on her mission so much that she doesn't really care what she has to do to get there? And right. I think that's part of it. But that's a good point that Aes Sedai are not necessarily persecuted throughout much of this world so they can Correct. use those negative images to their advantage as a, yes. a form of power yeah and again i don't believe they start them because that would be lying but mm -hmm. as far as uh, as there's many of the rumors that surround them but but they don't do anything to quell them either and once they find out about them they may feed those rumors just a little bit like you mm -hmm. said in some of the things that moraine and perhaps even other i said i have done over the years uh, again because when there's mystery unknown powers for the person uh, that garners respect and yes. uh, e even though it's, it may be a hateful respect by some people a loving respect by others it's a respect by all and that's that's something the tower desires because that's again it's part of their political power they they could very rarely ever force a ruler or a country to to do what they want but they will use whatever they have to manipulate them to achieve the ends of the tower yeah, that's true. And this is a form of manipulation that Jordan uses elsewhere in the books too, not just with the Aes Sedai. I'm thinking back to yeah. Julian Sandar's intimidation techniques when he's questioning someone and yes. he will just list three random things and make the prisoner wonder about, oh my gosh, what horrific things is he going to do with the mice and the rope right. or whatever. <laughs> um, and I think Jordan really seems to like that idea that the mystery gives you some kind of power. Right, right. And, and, and of course, we see that as just being true in human nature. And that's uh, one of the wonderful things of, of this series. So anyway, let's get to the heart of this mm -hmm. chapter. The heart of this chapter is the being prepared or the steps they go through and a light is stepping in, helping them prepare. I, like you, did not read New Spring until I had read several other books in the series. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know that I actually put it in order where it went, but I already knew some of the backstory. I knew about of Moraine, I knew much about Siwan and Elida and these, or Elida and these kind of the interplay between us three. But it was chilling when she just walks into the room, and it, I think it was laid out that way intentionally, is to be a, ch a chilling scene without being a horror story. Mm -hmm. um, here's this woman who's coming in to help them. So let me get your thoughts on this. Does she help them? Does she hurt them? Mm, this is a, a good question. That's, I think it's a question of intent versus impact, at least that that's, uh, I could see that needing to be brought up here. Elida right. seems like she's intending to make them better through some really tough methods, uh, like she has voiced before, but uh, I don't know that it has that impact because Moiraine was about the same amount of readiness before and after Elida's outright beatings. She was making right. it through about two thirds of the weaves before Elida showed up. And yeah. during Elida's uh, uh, testing, she can't even quite reach that amount. And then right. after Elida is not allowed to pick on them anymore, she's still only doing about two thirds. And she still right. only has done the 100 weaves maybe about three times total before she gets called for the testing. Right. Uh, yes, exactly. Uh, but then again, I, th I think of this, and of course, we can use the power of hindsight to, uh, to go back from what we know will happen. The test is tougher than I would have imagined. Mm, yeah. Uh, so even though, even though Moraine has only been able to make it through about 62, 63, whatever test before and again after Elida's ministrations, I wonder, was she more prepared in a way, just the ability to bear up the pain of it? Um, and that's something we can get into when we get into the test itself. Mm -hmm. and, and perhaps that's something readers can talk about or listeners excuse me, can talk about and debate among themselves. You know, did she really help or hurt? Again, we know her intent. Um, right. you know, she said, she said, you know, it's pitiful. You'll never pass like that. And I want you to pass, child. You mm -hmm. will pass. And she emphasizes that. I think at this point, Elida still has sort of an infatuation with Moiraine and Siwan as she sees them as equals. 
mm-hmm. or, or potential equals. I don't think she sees them as that way now, but once they attain the shawl, and there are very few equals that she has in the tower. She's a woman of power and ambition. We could always debate, you know, how that shaped her or, or how that, whether that made her better as an Aes Sedai or worse, but she was a woman of power and ambition and, and she wanted to see power in others. Now, again, I think only in her image, mm, <laughs> she wanted, yeah. she wanted them powerful, but she wanted them powerful in her image. And that's not what happens here. Whatever her intent was, it, it certainly backfired on her. Now, whether or not it helped Moraine and Siwan, I don't know that we could ever know because all we can know is the events that did happen, not the events that could have happened. Mm-hmm. But um, it definitely backfired on her because they would never now shape themselves into her image. That They might be her equals once they've attained the shawl. They might even surpass her in some regards but they would never be in her image. She, uh, this set up an enmity between her and, and them. And a lot of that's yeah. a misunderstanding. You know, when they're going to breakfast a few mornings later after Marianne had put a stop to all of it and she glares daggers at them, you know, they, to me, they could have said something. They could have mollified her in some regard. They just walked up to her and said, we did not say anything. I don't know who did, you know, mm. uh, but that's not something you do with a Sadai. That's Yeah. Um, or maybe with anybody who has some kind of power over you like that. Well, that's true. That's true. That's, I could see that being intimidating. I really felt Moiraine's sense of kind of fear and being trapped, especially when they found out that Elida didn't get in trouble for harming them, but got in trouble for helping them cheat on the test through, right. you know, bizarre loopholes in tower law. Uh, yes. Elida apparently didn't break any in terms of her use of the power on them. It was more of the integrity of the test that was the right. problem. And I think we can draw a difference between talking about whether this trial that they went through actually helped Moiraine and Suan ultimately. And that's mm-hmm. a different question from whether did Elida do the right thing or the wrong thing? Because I still yeah. view what she did as abusive and wrong even if it yes. down the road led to improvements in uh, our main girls as I said I exactly I think those are separate questions yes oh I agree I, and I should have thought of it and phrased it that way I, I, I'm glad you did because that's very good I think and this is just my opinion that ultimately she helped them she made them better mm. but at the same time uh, what she did was completely wrong had she wished to, she, she might have sat them down and explained the test is going to be harder than you think. Mm-hmm. What your friends are doing, trying to distract you is not enough. I'm going to you know, make this very rough on you. And, and I'm going to heal you immediately afterward. Mm, you know? yeah. And I want you to know I'm doing this because I, I care about you. I want you to pass. I do not want you to fail. And, and perhaps approach the entire thing from another perspective. Maybe. Mm, yeah, was changed. I still doubt it because they still fear and mistrust her. They do. Um, yeah, there's some people who are just oil and water, and they're not going to mix. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's the case with these. With, with these, even though Elida wants wants to see the best in them, that that's just not who they are, and it's never going to be who they are. And she doesn't understand that the, the fault there is Elida's. The way she approaches it is is wrong. Probably just with her personality, it comes across as hateful as mean as Mm. i hate you even though that i don't think that was her intent so she absolutely did the wrong thing she could have approached it so many different ways and have achieved the the same end result but because of who she is yeah it did it did not work Uh, right completely the wrong thing to do Mm -hmm. um but again directness is not an sdi trait um I, Mm. i think somehow they take intrigue and um and hidden meanings with their mother's milk, you know, um, mm-hmm. with, with Miriam, when she comes to them and explains, Hey, this is not going to happen again. You know, I've put in the into it. She won't come in here and, and bother you like this anymore. Moraine asks her outright, well, how'd you find out? Marianne never gives her a straight answer. Oh um, yeah. In, in fact, she kind of thinks to herself here, a, a, you know, never a straight answer when a mystery would do and perhaps do better. Uh, you know, there's just, they're not going to get that from her. They're not going to get a straight approach from, uh, from Elida on what she's doing or why she's doing it. And again, that meeting in the hallway, 
you know, they can't go up directly to her and say, okay, we, we're not the ones who told. I know you're upset at us, but we didn't do it. Even when Warren and C1 see Alida in the corridor and, and they could go up and talk to her, they find themselves un, unable to. They're, they're such a part of, of the intrigue themselves. They've lived in this environment so long, they cannot take a direct approach with her. They, they could with each other, but only because of their friendship. But that's just not how S Sedai treat each other. Yeah. Uh, and I don't think it would feel safe for them to be able to do that. That's the sense I got from uh, being in Moraine's shoes in this chapter. I felt, again, yeah. scared and trapped and fearing retaliation. Because now that yes. we know that Elida can get away with physically harming someone like that and through a loophole of Tower Law and not, you know, get a slap on the wrist, if anything, uh, I think that would make me never want to come forward with anything if I were them. Yeah. And I, I also think there is the possibility that helped uh, strengthen the girls in some way. And mm -hmm. that's a thing that does happen in real life. Post-traumatic growth is something that people can, people can come out on the other side of something difficult as a better person, certainly. But I think oh. they would probably still have the attitude about it being like, well, not that I would ever choose for that to happen to me again or choose to go through it again or wish it on anyone else, but I know that I wouldn't be the person that I am today without it. And I can yeah. imagine, I don't know that we ever see Moiraine really re reflect on her situation with Elida like this because she thinks, oh, we've made an enemy for life and she kind of just seems to be afraid of her after yeah. that uh, in this chapter. But I could imagine someone having that attitude after a situation like this. Yes, yes. And and I think, too, the contrasting points of view that the two girls have here, you know, Moraine, you're talking about it after after Elida first came in and, and heard from that way and left, you know, and, and she says, I think Elida really is trying to help us. She says she wants us to pass. And Siwan says, well, I don't recall hearing her say that. <laughs> yeah, uh, she, she actually, did say it. Say it but, yeah. But it's but see you on, you know, she didn't see it that way. Mm -hmm. And then afterward, you see Moraine having, like you said, more of a fear of Elida. And, and she, she's the one that kind of remarked in her head that, you know, this was not a small enmity that just fester over time. They had acquired an enemy for life. And yet see one comes right out and says, once I gain the shawl, if she ever tries to harm me again, I will make her pay. Mm. Oh, the foreshadowing of that. You oh, know, so I know. You see, you know, Moraine responds at first with kind of more forgiveness, see you on without. Moraine responds in the long run with, with more fear, and see you on seems to have none. She, she's kind of internalized it, and she's turned it into uh, payback, you know, one of these days. Yeah. You know, she has no fear of her, but maybe an anger toward her or a resentment toward her at least, and how that plays out in coming years. It's just it's painful to read those words. It really is. Uh, that's something about Suwan's personality that comes out in other parts of this chapter, too. It seems like she worries less than Moiraine. Uh, and we don't, I mean, we can't know whether that's really the truth. Moiraine is kind of freaking out about some of the stuff like, oh my gosh, if the test is this hard, I, I don't know how I'm going to pass. Um, or she's wondering about all these different foretellings. And Suwan's attitude seems like, let's just move on. Uh, but it's hard to know whether that's just what she says versus how she actually feels. Cause we're not in her head at any point. Right. So yeah, it's, it's hard to say. It's interesting that Suwan uses the, the wheel we use as the wheel wills to kind of ward off worrying about stuff that they can't change, which is a good attitude. I think if there's something you actually can't do anything to change, maybe don't spend a lot of time worrying about it, but Moraine doesn't seem so easily soothed by it. Correct. Yeah. Absolutely. Just the, the differences in their personality. Uh, probably one of the things that drew them to being friends. Uh, those are differences where they, they, they have a different perspective, yet they strengthen one another with that, uh, yeah. rather than just trying to be copies of one another. I but, don't have a lot else about this chapter, so I'm going to let you okay. move on to your synopsis. Chapter nine. Uh, this one is called It Begins. Now, chapter eight, we heard it ended with Marion. In, in her shawl coming up to Moraine and saying, you know, Moraine de Madrid, you're going to be tested for the shawl. So Moraine is very apprehensive as she follows Marion down into the basement levels to be tested. And, and as she's walking, we don't know how far this is, but evidently it's pretty lengthy. It's to places that, that she's never been accepted or not allowed to go here, obviously. She had three urgent thoughts. The first one was she wasn't ready. 
she was just not prepared for this. Uh, she had only performed all 100 weeds twice, she said. So she was at all not prepared for this. Um, the second thought was that she would not give up channeling if she failed, as some women had. And she kind of reminisced on things she had heard. Because you know, if you were put out of the tower, you, you were not to interfere in things that the tower did. And some women were so afraid of that, that they would just pretty much give up channeling altogether. And Moraine, that was, that was her second big thought. I will not give up channeling. She loved that so much. And, um, and, and probably because she held more of Sadar than many of the other women. She was very powerful in it. I would think the joy would only increase the more you were able to hold. Perhaps because this is so closely tied to her personal identity, to who she is, she would not give up channeling. And the third thing, she realized she still had her book. In fact, it was in her pocket at that moment. And she determined she would continue her search for the dragon reborn, even after failing the test and being cast out of the tower, knowing she wasn't to interfere in tower politics anymore. She, she was determined she was not going to give up the, uh, or the search for the dragon reborn. So evidently, and this is just in my mind, the seeing the foretelling that Guitara gave or hearing it and seeing Guitara die, that had impressed something on her about how important this mission was, probably more important than most of anything the tower had done in centuries. Uh, anyway, so she had these three thoughts, and she was kind of comforted by the thought that one way or another, she would be able to begin her search tomorrow. That, that was the thing that, that comforted her, that kind of eased her apprehension somewhat. In fact, she was so rattled by these thoughts going over her mind and her fear of what she was about to face in this test, that she even whispered or kind of said quietly, the wheel weaves as the wheel wheels. And it was something she was saying to try to calm herself. As you said, it was something that Si Yuan said often, so she probably was trying to use this to, to calm herself. And then she remembered she's supposed to be silent after they've gone into the basement. She's not supposed to say anything at this point. But um, if they continue on down to the lowest level, um, to doors that they're described as being as large as fortress gates, big polished doors with no iron bands. Mirion Sadai uses a weave of wind to open them. And there's this large oval with flickering lights in the opening that's floating, unsupported, in the center of this big high-domed room. It was a terangrial. And so they have this short ceremony. You know, they ask her some ritual words. She repeats back the answers. And Moraine is given some hurried instructions. Uh, she's shown a six-pointed star symbol that's created by three overlapping ovals. And then one sister begins to settle a weave over her as they all, as many sisters gather around, thrice repeat, remember what must be remembered. Again, this all has a feeling of something very ritualized, something they've all gone through. And it's probably um, something has happened to every S. Sedai for many centuries in the past. Then the S. Sedai begin this complex weave on the Terran Grial as Moraine undresses. She has to enter the trials clad only in the light. This is just something uh, that they have to do. One of the S. Sedai that's, that's current there is uh, Elida, who shoots her a heated gaze. Um, Moraine has to struggle again to keep this calm composure. The weave continues. It causes the Terangrael to flash faster and faster. It begins to spin. And finally, it shines out this glaring light. And without being told, Moraine knows what she has to do. She steps into that light and into the Terangrael and steps into an empty room. Her memory is full of holes. She, she doesn't remember what she's doing there. She knows who she is but she has no clue what she's doing. She has no memory of the test itself, none of these things. Uh, clothes appear, but kind of when she's not looking, um, specifically it's her clothes. As she walks up to them, she notices that the markings on it, they're from House de Madrid. Uh, then there's shoes, and as she's getting dressed, suddenly there's a mirror. You know, things are just kind of appearing, and it seems strange, but not so strange that she stops what she's doing. After all, this is uh, her, you know, the Sun Palace. This is where she belongs. She walks out of this open doorway in this beautiful sunlit courtyard there in the Sun Palace. Uh, she sees the star symbol that she's supposed to look for. She doesn't remember specifically what it is, but just knows she has to go to it in an unhurried fashion. So it's there and worked in brass and a, a stone, some stonework in the center of the courtyard. And as she makes her way there, one by one, her articles of clothing just disappear until again, she's walking without a stitch on 
And before she reaches it, three men enter the courtyard. Uh, this has got to be one of her greatest fears. You know, we, we've talked about how prudish she is before anyway. But these commoners in, in common laborer clothes, rough spun clothes, they begin to leer at her, openly ogle at her. And so they begin to approach. They're sauntering over. Moraine just burns with shame, but she continues unhurriedly. For some reason, she knows she has to do this. Um, she reaches the uh, the symbol, begins to channel, and channels a wall of air between her and the three men. And now she can just kind of turn her back to them, pretend like they're not there, bluff them out. And she looks around, and the doorway from which the men had entered, there's the star symbol again. So she heads toward it and just ignores them. And as soon as she reaches it, she steps through into another place entirely with no memory of what's just happened. All she knows is she's, she's naked and she's holding Sadar. So she releases Sadar. Um, there are some ugly, rough homespun clothes with rough leather shoes there, but they fit her and she puts them on. Uh, she can see the courtyard back behind her, yet she doesn't remember anything about it. And yet she moves forward down this rough, doorless corridor. Ahead is lit by some lamps. Kind of gives you the feeling of something maybe going underground. It's, it's just very different from where she came from. And it opens out into a small village. It's just, you know, completely different place from where she's left. This village is obviously deserted because of a terrible drought. Everything is dead. No one is there. So she walks to a well in the center of town where she spied the symbol once again as she's looking for it. She doesn't remember why she's looking for it, just that she has to. When she gets there, she begins a weave. Uh, you know, embraces Sadar, begins to weave these um, elements together. She, she knows somehow she's supposed to. Uh, and I guess, I, I guess our listeners and any readers of the story know this is the second of the 100 weaves that they have to learn. They're never told what the weaves are for when they're learning them. But she begins to weave. And suddenly she is caught in these thorn bushes, terrible thorn bushes, to the point that it's, it's, it's tearing her skin and she's bleeding. She can't even turn her head really to look. And she sees a death's head spider approaching her. This is something from the Aeol Waste, a, a deadly venomous spider. In the middle of the weaves that she's already making, Moraine shoots this tiny bit of fire, just enough to kill the spider, but not enough to ignite the thorn bushes, which would, you know, if they were to ignite, it would go up in a conflict conflagration that would kill her and, and she knows this so she continues to weave and there here are more spiders and more spiders there are dozens of them there's hundreds of them she can't turn her head to see those approaching from the other side but she continues to use these little tiny bits of fire to kill each one until she completes the weave once the weave is complete instantly the thorns disappear the spiders disappear and she sees the symbol she's looking for on a house uh, so she approaches the house, steps inside, and suddenly she has no memory, again, of why she's bleeding, what she's going through, where she's coming from. She said that strangely, it takes about 15 minutes to walk across the room of this small house. So I guess she's moving almost in a dreamlike state uh, toward a light that she sees ahead of her. Approaches it. It takes about another 15 minutes to get to it, and it's an open door, and she walks through to find herself in an in walled square. Uh, with the star symbol in the center of it. As she approaches it, here she sees a Trolloc climb over a wall and begin running at her. Now, she's never seen a Trolloc before, but she's, she's seen drawings, she's heard descriptions, she knew what it was, and she knows she can't run. She has to continue to the symbol unhurriedly. But So she, she moves basically as quickly as she can without hurrying. Uh, she begins to hear other Trollocs climbing over, some behind her where she can't see you, you, you get the impression at this point, her heart rate is, is really quickened. She, she doesn't know why this is happening, but she's going to the symbol. Gets there, suddenly begins weaving just to save her life, uh, throwing fireballs at the, the Trollocs. And she has certain weaves she has to do. And again, this is the third of the 100 that she had to learn. And, and the Trollocs keep coming and she can't kill them fast enough. So she, she falls back to a dance. She, uh, described it as a courtly dance. So she begins to dance through the the courtyard. She's moving back and forth, dodging the, the Trollocs, hitting them with fireballs, killing them. She finishes the weave just as the last Trolloc dies. And as it does, all of them are dead. She looks, 
and there's a doorway there opening out from the courtyard, going out into the blight with the symbol above it. And Moraine approaches it, and thus ends chapter nine. This one has a little more action to it <laughs> yeah. than some of the other uh, some of the other chapters. But one thing I, I like the balance of it. You you see the chapter open with these three urgent questions she has in her mind, and it, it kind of outlines them um, very clearly. These these are three questions she has in her mind, and it ends with three steps of the trial. Uh, so like it's kind of a balance. You begin with three questions. You're ending with three answers. We finally get to get a glimpse of mm. what the the um, the trials are and what it's like and why there's so much apprehension toward it because none of the s i ever tell you except of what the trials are about what they will face how it's going to happen none of that so she walks into a complete mystery and and we begin to get a glimpse of what it is and it's uh i have to say i like the way this story spins out uh it's pretty obvious something about this teron Grial gets into a person's head and it brings forth their biggest fears yeah We've already seen Moiraine's fears of of um, you know, anything scandalous at all, anything uh, sexual at all. She's has very Puritan ideas uh, about that. She's things you don't think about, much less talk about. And that was the first step in the trial. Um, the second one, the spiders. Now, I had to kind of think about this, and I may be wrong, but this being a death's head spider, which lives in the Aiel Wastes, the Aiel just had a war against not just, you know, the, the, the Westerners here, but specifically against uh, the House de Montred. I mean, so I wonder if this is kind of a subconscious thing. It's, it mm. wouldn't be just any venomous spider, but it's one that comes from the Aiel waste. Uh, oh, that's I, a maybe fun detail. Oh, yeah. I like <laughs> that, though. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I may be reading too much into it, but uh, to me, that, that just kind of made a subconscious thing. The Aiel they've just destroyed some of her family. They had, it's, you know, again, she didn't know this, but maybe subconsciously she picked up on it. They have something against us, my family specifically. Mm. Uh, maybe not, but um, either way, here's the death's head spider approaching her. And, and what girl is not scared of spiders? I mean, there are a few, but they're not many. This is kind of almost a universal thing. So it's never mentioned it before, but, um, but I kind of, I kind of perceive that, especially when, once the spiders disappeared and the thorn bushes disappeared, she has this thought, what if they're inside my clothes? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, she, you know, they're still here. They're still crawling to them. There's still this, this creepy crawly aversion to them. Uh, and then the Trollocs, you got to remember Trollocs are huge. Moraine is small. She's, oh. she's a small woman. Very tiny. Uh, so it's, yes. And it's kind of just this inferiority thought of anything much bigger than me. Uh, and, mm. and, and I kind of thought of that too with those that she hears coming up behind her, but she can't see them. And the, she hears them running toward her and she has to walk and still make it to this symbol oh, before yeah. they reach her and kill her. So it's kind of the, kind of the thoughts of the nameless fear. You know, mm -hmm. the, it's, again, we talked about before, the, the fear in your imagination is much bigger than the fear of something you can actually see. And, and you see a little of that playing into this just in her subconscious. You know, things bigger than her, rushing at her, attacking her from all sides. And, and especially, you've got to wonder, when when is the arrow going to strike? When is the, the mm. axe going to hit me? Can I reach the symbol first? So you uh, you, you see, kind of perceive that, that fear of what's behind her, coming up behind her. That probably bothered her more than the one she could see in front of her that was rushing at her. I got the sense that this Tarangrial works a little different from the one in the accepted test. So the accepted test is it does seem to bring out their fears and Shiriam even tells Nynaeve, we don't know if they're real worlds or not. Maybe they're alternate realities. Maybe they, who knows what it is. Um, mm -hmm. But in this one, I think when we see, like when we see Nynaeve go through her, also her shawl test eventually, this one seems to be simulated by the sisters themselves. Maybe they are able to use some weaves to pull some stuff out of the, um, accepted's mind to create right. this but i get the sense they are creating it because after Nynaeve's test we have some sisters saying wow that was really messed up you guys like really you know crossed the line here in how badly you terrorized her with this test ah you know it had been so long since i had read that i i had forgotten 
I had forgotten what that was like, the, the test to accept it and the test for, to the shawl for naive. Um, but I believe you're right. Yeah, they've got to play into it. In, in my mind, I thought of this being similar to Teleron mm-hmm. Riyadh, mm-hmm. um, where in Teleron Riyadh, it, it brings forth kind of a shadow of the, of the real world. Mm-hmm. This one, I say bringing forth a shadow of your subconscious. Uh, so it, it's, I think it is a real world, but the real things in there are kind of created by your thoughts, your fears, mm. uh, and probably given shape and life by the, the weavings again. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, the, so they're, they're feeding into it, you know, what is pulling from you, creating. Uh, and again, if they're, if they're going to feed stronger weaves into it, then those fears are going to be bigger. They're going to be oh. multiplied. They're going to be yeah. faster. Now, this is just my thoughts of trying to rationalize mm-hmm. how this works. Uh, I may be off in it. And further study, I'm sure, could uh, could provide more information. But that's a brutal test. It is. But it, it kind of lets you see why discipline in the tower is so brutal. Mm-hmm. Not just because they want you to conform to them, but they want you to um, to survive. I mean, this this yeah. is because I believe if you die here in that Tehran Grail, you die for real mm. um, because you're there. You're a part of that world and you're fitting into the rules of that world, even though it doesn't always make sense mm-hmm. by our standards. You're fitting into the rules of that world. If you if you just fail, if you run out of there and, and leave the Tehran Grail, you know, you fail the test for the shawl, you leave the tower. But if you don't survive the test, I believe you you just don't survive. So they're trying to you know, pull out those fears, have them face the fears, have them overcome the fears, be a stronger person than they were when they walked in there. Because as they said in some of the ritualized things, uh, you know, you'll, you'll come in with no knowledge. You'll walk out with the knowledge of who you are, mm. um, so to speak. I'm paraphrasing that. But. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, come in with a, a greater knowledge of who you are because you face your greatest fears and you overcome them. You overcome them with calm assurance. You overcame them not just by fighting them, but by doing what you were trained to do, even when it didn't make sense. Even these weaves that, mm. that make no sense in the real world, they make sense there. Uh, I don't know why there's just a hundred of them. I don't know if that's part of the weaving that the Esedai do. Mm-hmm. Is that something the Esedai have chosen? Um, probably so, um, because again, if this, if this is a world that is a reflection of the things of your mind, uh, you know, how long you stay in there, what you do in there would be your choice, I would think. Yeah. But the, the tower is as focused on preservation of these girls as much as discipline in, in conformity. I think that they don't necessarily have to conform to, um, you know, be the same person as we do in our military training today. And we've, we've equated the tower life to that several times Mm -hmm. in these different chapters, but not, not to conform them in the way they dress, the way they act, the things they say, the way they respond to give them the endurance that they need to survive and face anything out in the real world they'll be faced with. Yeah. You know, I think there's a couple of different ways of viewing these purposeless weaves at first. Uh, My first time I read through, I thought, okay, this is tower mission creep striking again. Um, yeah. Of course, they had to do something completely pointless instead of learning how to do practical weaves, um, just mm-hmm. because the tower has gotten so far from its original mission and its methods are kind of suspect sometimes. But yeah. I only, while you were talking, I just thought of the purposeless labor that the IEL wise ones make their apprentices do. And we actually kind of see that as a, a strong training method. I think most fans view IEL Wise One training as uh, very effective. Yeah. Uh, you know, they make them sift through little grains of rice or carry rocks or just purposeless stuff. And mm-hmm. they learn lessons from it. So I think that this test probably accomplishes the same purpose, which is why we see I said I able to keep this calm. I yeah. also think another cool thing about the three questions you noted that Maureen had in her head, one of them was um, about the fact that really no matter the outcome of the test, she was going to continue her mission. And that is what got me thinking about Nynaeve and her tests in the first place to compare them and think about how the Tirangriol works because in Nynaeve's uh, shawl testing, that was her attitude as well was like, well, if they declare that I failed this, 
uh, I'm still who I am. This does not change who I am one bit. I can still yeah. channel. I still cleanse Sidene. Um, and it's not going to change the fact that I'm on my mission to help Rand and to help all of my people, no matter what. And yeah, that is so naive. I mean, just, yeah, <laughs> just it really so, is. Yeah. But it was so, what you want to do. And when you throw, I will keep going. Yeah. <laughs> but it was so cool to see more rain with the same attitude because in yes. eye of the world and throughout much of the series, oh, I think yes. we can see those two women as uh, butting heads a lot, but they're actually so much more similar. Maureen's right. just been a lot more trained to keep her temper under the surface and her right. single minded focus, but they still mm -hmm. both have those qualities. Yes, I, I never thought of that before. Never juxtaposed those two as in, in as far as those character elements, their their personalities. But um, yeah, very stubborn, very headstrong. Um, in Moraine's case, very controlled. In Nynaeve's case, very uncontrolled. Yet they're both, in a sense, doing what they have dedicated themselves to do out of love. In Moraine's case, it, it's a love for the world. I don't want to see the world mm -hmm. broken. I want to guide the dragon. I want to, even before she knew who he was, you know, I want to be there. I want to help him. I want, I want to be the one to, to influence this. And of course, we see she does. I mean, willing to sacrifice herself in every way possible in order to see that done. And in Nynaeve's case, it's just, hey, these are my people. I grew up with them. You know, I, I may have been, you know, just a little kid, but I was there when they were born, you know, when they were playing around in the dirt. You're not going to take them from me. I don't care if you're Moraine as Sedai or if you're, you know, Tarman Gaidon. I, mean, I don't care who you are. I'm going to be there. <laughs> uh -huh. You're going to deal with me before you deal with them. That's all I had for this chapter in terms of thoughts. Do you have anything else before we do our sign off? Uh, no. I feel very pleased in breaking down these chapters to see mm. what we we've we've seen in them. Um, I mean, so much rich detail, and and again, these it's really bringing out more and more of of Moraine's personality in a good way. I, I'm I'm a bigger fan of her the more I study her. Absolutely, uh, and, and and looking at the details of these chapters. Great. So, uh, dear listeners, join us next time to finish Moraine's shawl test and also get a deeper look into tower rituals. Uh, if you want to get in touch with us, follow me on Twitter at Lajara Sedai, that's L-A-J-A-R-A-S-E-D-A-I, or email me at Lajara Dane, same first name, uh, Dane is D-A-Y-N-E at gmail.com, or check out our website at lajaradane.wixsite, W-I-X-S-I-T-E dot com slash wheel of mine. Great. Well, you know, I was, here's one funny thing, I guess, for after show that I thought yeah. of with the um, purposeless weaves. I imagine sort of an alternate timeline where we imagine some kind of use for them in a very karate mm -hmm. kid kind of way. Like, oh, you've been doing this mindless work that you think has nothing to do with being yeah. eyes and eye. <laughs> and then we'll that's actually show you how it works. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of, I think I anticipated maybe that the testing would be something like that before I ever saw like read through one of the tests but it right. didn't turn out that way but i just think that would be a funny outcome. Yeah. yeah i'll tell you one one thing that's kind of struck me about the testing and and during the main part of our uh, breakdown here i've tried to i've tried to stop talking about the the world building um, mm -hmm. and i think i feel more comfortable doing it in the after show but but one thing i've noticed in this is um the detail we're given in the testing I think is very good. Most other stories, most other world buildings, whether it's it's movies or books or whatever the, the case may be, whatever the media we have, is you know, they build up to some type of great trial or great test, and you get to that great trial, that big test, and it's kind of a letdown. You mm. you know, think to yourself oftentimes, that's all it is, you know. Uh, they want to put some big twist on it so it's different from, from what you perspective or, mm -hmm. or excuse me, from what you expected. In this case, um, I think I think Robert Jordan did such a great job of of building up the mystery ahead of time, you know, so they don't know oh, what yeah. they're facing. So when you get there, he can make it as tough as you can envision. Um, again, with the whole thing with them losing parts of their memory, you know, they they know what they've got to do, but they don't know why. Things don't make sense, but I'm so confused that I can go with it and deal with it anyway, you know. Mm. Um, it does kind of take away the fear and the apprehension 
you know, of, oh my gosh, I'm only, you know, three steps through a hundred steps. Yeah. She doesn't know how many steps she's gone through. She doesn't know how many she has to face. You know, all that apprehension is gone. Just I'm faced with what's in front of me and that's it. And I think that's one reason she could make it through all a hundred mm. weeds here in this world when she couldn't in the real world. Real world, she's still dealing with, huh. you know, oh, my fear of this and I've got to remember this. And, and so the, I think the spells here in the Tarangrial world are, are, are helping you, you know, to forget some things and remember other things. And wow. just focus on just what's right in front of you. But to me, these trials are as, as tough as you can imagine yeah. because it is facing, among other things, your biggest fears, even if you're not aware of them um, and probably the greatest fears you'll ever face. So I think you did such a great job of that because like I said, so many other things you get to the big, turning point in the story or the big trial or the great test, the, the boss battle. And then you, you mm -hmm. stop and say, really, that was it. It should have been so much more than that. And in yeah. this case, he doesn't leave you wanting more. He leaves you breathless and saying that, that was tough. You know, I, I think I could have made it through it, but just barely, you know, <laughs> and I, I don't want to learn if I can, if I can do that or not. Yeah, um, I think you're right. And I didn't really think about this from a meta perspective in that these tests really show his ability to write climaxes. Yes. yes. And I think it's, we think of him as a strong world builder. A lot of times that's something that a lot of people really get into this series for, because if you get to book four and you don't care about the IEL, you're probably not going to keep going. Right. So yeah, that's yeah. what a lot of us are in it for, but he doesn't disappoint with the climaxes. There are some books later on that maybe don't have enough of them, towards right. the middle, but um, this one, I sort of remembered New Spring being that way too. And now that I'm rereading it, I'm finding that it has a lot more uh, dynamism to it than I yes. thought. Yes, The only time I think I've walked away from one of these encounters in the story, climax of the story, and thought that should have been more, just my opinion, in the eye of the world, the Jolly Green Giant. You know, that's mm -hmm. all I could think of. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> With the Green Man. You know, he was the Jolly Green Giant. And and I felt kind of let down and disappointed by that one. Of course, yeah. then we meet the Forsaken, and you find that, that there are Forsaken, uh, you know, and, and these things at the end. They kind of save it, kind of rescue it. And the rest of the books, you know, turn the story to me in a more serious direction after that encounter with yes. the Green Man. Um, I, that, that I agree. That. But that's my opinion. That's just Tom Bombadil of the, <laughs> the entire series. That, uh, and again, he recovered it later. He uh, brought this back. It, mm -hmm. it, it, a, a great importance in the story, but um, but it, it just always seemed a little comical to me. But other than that, I can't think of one thing in these stories where the the climax of that part of the story let you down. Mm -hmm. I can't think of one thing you walk away from saying, "Man, that just should have been so much better." You walk away saying, "I want more." Um, you know, can can other people? build on this world some more you know I, I want the show i want the movies i want the <laughs> the the uh the graphic novels i want you know the more i can get of this the better mm. because so in depth is so rich and it works together so well you know i agree that the the eye of the world ending was one of the weakest climaxes in the story like you said it felt um the the pacing of that book was such that you're running you're running you're running pretty much 90% of the book. And then in the final 10%, there's this big climax that seems like it came out of nowhere. You barely hear yeah. about the eye of the world at all or know what the goal of the book is right. um, until you get there. And then the green man seems like definitely a deus ex machina, which is kind of how you were, it sounded like what yeah. you were saying. He, and especially the fact that Moiraine says, and everyone says, you can't meet the green man twice. And Moiraine has somehow met him before, but they meet him again through great need. I kind of hope that they take that part out of the show because it really doesn't add much of anything to the story. We already know yeah. that it's like magical that the eye of the world shows up where you need it to be instead yes. of, which is strange enough anyway, but um, I think you didn't need the added layer of strangeness that somehow Moiraine right. gets to meet him twice. Right. And um, yeah, I agree that he really rescued um, I think his name is Sameshta. The I think he really rescued the green man in book four when we see him through the um, 
Roydian sequence when yes. Yes. Rand goes through the glass columns. That's when I actually cared about him. And on a reread, I felt him to be really sad, <laughs> you know, yes. that he can't yeah. remember anything. And you see that scar on his face. And I, I actually got invested in him at that point. But yeah. it's only on a reread that I really yes. cared. Yeah. Yeah, the fir first time through, it, it just uh, kind of put me off a little bit. And um, had the, you know, had I had to wait two or three years for the second book or something, at that time, I probably would not have gone for it. But mm, yeah. I had it there, had it available, began it immediately after the first one. Because I had, I think the first three maybe had been written at that point. Okay. And by three books into the series, I mean, you're, you're hooked. So I think so. I think so. I, um... I think there's one other example I can think of that I felt was a little bit of a letdown, but I don't know if this was a Sanderson not knowing how to wrap stuff up if there wasn't enough details on it. So it's, it's, I feel a little unfair. It's a little unfair to criticize climax problems in the last three books because of that. Yeah. But the one that I think is a little disappointing was Pat on Fane. Um, Matt just, immediately defeats him i don't even remember how it was over so quickly yeah. they just there's a show there's kind of this showdown between them and then immediately pat on fane's just gone and it's like he was being built up to be a lot scarier and a lot yeah. more of a big bad especially through all throughout the great hunt he's terrifying yeah. he yeah. nails yes. the murder all to a door he's skinning people yes. alive um that's the books definitely get darker just because of this character oh, yeah. and then kind of just don't know where he's going yeah. after that. He just, he just kind of brushed off. You're right. I didn't think of that. Uh, I have, and, and again, I've, I've only read, you know, the last half of the story one time. So yeah, I'm, well, same I, for me at this point. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's just been a little um, more recent, maybe. Yeah, yeah. It's just it's been a while, so I haven't really thought of that. But you're right. It, you know, built up as as the boogeyman over and over, and something even some of the Forsaken are kind of a little apprehensive about you know because yeah. he's a, he's so rogue you know who's this guy he's such a wild card territory right yeah and then yeah he just kind of brushed off at the end of it I not thought of that that may be like you said something that was not outlined specifically enough and, and jordan maybe had not thought ahead exactly how he was going to do it just the fact he was going to mm -hmm. and sanderson picked up the story you know just ended it the best way he knew how or ended that yeah. portion wow. of, of that storyline that that thread in the wheel in that way um but uh, still again it's um there there are not a lot of loose ends in, no. in the weaving of the story um, yeah no that's something that's really incredible with a series spanning this far with this many characters just thinking of other you know epic series um i mean people are constantly arguing about how if it's even possible george rr R. martin can wrap up the song of ice and fire books and right. he doesn't have these kind of notes ready for anybody else to do it if something happens to him. So um, I am just deeply impressed by how much Robert Jordan did leave and how he yes. did um, scaffold for uh, Brandon to be able to finish it because that's such, I mean, I think you can kind of feel the slog in the series is when the world starts to expand and then it becomes harder and harder to figure out how to bring everything together and wrap it oh, up. Yes. yes. And I think that's a place George R. R. Martin is in too, without any clear direction on how that's going to finish. Right. Right. I, I believe in his mind, Jordan knew how he wanted it to end. He had, well, they, yeah. in fact, they said he had the ending planned out, mm -hmm. but there are at least two of the books I'm going to say, but maybe books 10 and 11, but mm -hmm. two were basically the entire book is just moving chess pieces around the board. You know, yeah. you're, getting, you're getting someone to this point and you're getting another group of people at this point and this isolated character to that point, because you're going to need them all together at the end, but not a lot really happens. You know, I, mm -hmm. and I can't even think of exactly which book because it, it's that. I know. <laughs> and it still is such an integral part of the story. You wouldn't skip it. You couldn't have done without it, but yeah, there gets to the point where I think you're you're slogging through having to read it, just as he slogged through having to write it, because you had to be there for the story. But it's so difficult, and again, because you're you're dealing with so many countries, um, you know. And when I first read through, I thought the entire thing with the Sianchen didn't even need to be there. You know, oh, all they did is confuse mm, yeah. the whole story and take you on a side track that. Mm -hmm. But of course, they're important. And they're an important part of the story, and and it wouldn't be the same story without it. Um, and I, it would have been a much smaller story. He may have could have mm -hmm. written it with leaving several of these elements out, 
but it it would not have been as complete and in his mind they needed to be there so so yeah. there were so there's there's there are some of the books that are not enlightening again you just have to <laughs> you know just use dedication and slog and fight through them but the payoff is so worth it you know because yeah. it's, the, the story at the end uh, uses just about every element there and, and uses them in a, in a good way. Yeah. So. You know, it, it raises big questions for how the show can adapt this series because they are going to have to cut out quite a bit in order Oof. to, I mean, you can't keep people for 10 years. Eight, I mean, <laughs> you could, by the end of game of Thrones with eight seasons, everyone was just tired and ready to get it over with. It sounded like in all the interviews and everything. So, I certainly wouldn't want just for my viewing pleasure for actors and staff and everything to have to go through that. <laughs> right. So uh, uh, I think they're going to have to cut it down significantly to maybe yes, seven yes. or eight seasons. And part of how they could do that is by, you know, they may have to change the focus of some of the messaging to get rid of some of those storylines that you could do without and have right. a little bit of a different story, but still preserve a lot of the same message. Exactly. Leaving out the Sean Chan is an interesting choice. I've seen some people on the internet talking about that. I have also uh, seen some of the other ideas where things like Elaine's succession to the Andorran throne. Maybe that one was one that didn't impact other parts of the story as much. Um, even more Gase's arc after that, she went through a lot of abuse and we see her yes. overcome yes. that, but we could probably also do without seeing that maybe more, uh, maybe more Gase uh, dies and that's how Elaine succeeds to the throne. And maybe it happens at a time where um, Andor is more secure so that Elaine's not having to fight for it. But that way we still have, you know, one of Rand's three major love interests is a queen. Right. Uh, yeah, I can see them doing things like that. Um, or perhaps with the Xian Chen, you know, bring them in, but don't bring them into the story. Take them out and bring them back a few books later. You know, just oh, bring yeah, them in, you keep could. them there and, and tie it in, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you know yeah, they do show up very early. Um, yes. I think the, you know, the main reason I think they would need to be there is for that idea of making uneasy alliances, making allies yeah. with people who are normally your enemies to be able to... Um, defeat the dark one and the stuff that the Sean Chan does is so evil that it's very difficult for this kind of alliance to happen. And I think right. those, those ethics are extremely interesting. Like, do we team up with dictators to focus on global problems? I don't know. <laughs> you know, what, what yeah. are the ethics of working with people yeah. like that? that use extremely different methods. So maybe exactly. you could still raise that in the show with, I think we also have that with the white cloaks. So maybe you could do one or the yes. other and not both. Yes. Uh, or they, I could see them doing both, but, but again, the huge parts of that story arc are going to be, have, have to be taken out. Um, such as perhaps we don't see as much inside the, the citadel of the children of the light. And a lot mm, of that yeah. is like their politics. Of, yeah. Different leaders there and, and how that changes them. Um, yeah. I could see a lot of that taken out again, in my mind the Xianchen come they they are the big guy because the dragon reborn has to unite all these nations together so again yeah, yeah this we use them as focal point to try to do that um you know perhaps speed up some of the things well they'll have to speed up a lot of things but uh the 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 story arc with um oh i started saying matrim coffin and that's not who it is <laughs> with, with the story arc with Perrin abara and and the wolf brethren and, oh yeah and mm -hmm. you know that i could i could see that being being shortened down um, significantly he he yeah. is so reluctant with the wolf thing for so long we think he yes. starts he starts to use it more even in book two and you're thinking okay he's starting to accept the wolf and then wow. he keeps going through these long periods of shutting them out and the same thing with his leadership arc like don't call me a lord and then you think in like right. book four or something that he's accepted yeah. it and then way later he's still like don't call me a lord you know? right. yeah and and with fail being kidnapped yes uh, yeah that's another lord. unpopular storyline i think that right. people are saying you could cut this or shorten it significantly yeah. and, and and i love it about the story and how like she even comes to befriend some of the aiel there who perrin kills when he rescues her mm -hmm. she never mentions it to him you know yeah her, her love for him is so great you know she's not gonna not going to bring that because she knows how we crush him internally. So yeah, those whole parts of the story I think would be taken out. Maybe maybe fail is still there. 
you know, uh, they, they fall in love, you know, after the great hunt or she falls in love with him and kind of, you know, he doesn't have much choice in the matter. Right. That's know. how it seems. Um, and then, you know, the return to the two rivers, building it up, strengthening it up, um, uh, letting know they are under Andorra rule and things like that. Mm -hmm. I think are, you know, could be elements that are preserved, but so many of the side stories are going to have to be cut out of it. That it, it will be a different story, but I think it's going to be a, or could be a great one. I'm yeah. really hoping, I guess one of my biggest things is I just don't want them to screw it up. I know, <laughs> you know, another change that I had thought some about, and I've seen like Daniel Green on YouTube say this too, that maybe they could get rid of a chunk of the Forsaken who have sort of maybe redundant kind of roles or the ones we don't yes. hear much about. Like the, the number 13, I think sounds important and it seems yes. important to a lot of people. But if we were not as attached to that being an unlucky number in that world, it doesn't necessarily right. have to be, we could cut down the forsaken. But I think even if you kept 13, you mm -hmm. could cut down the fact that they keep getting resurrected with different faces and yes. different names. is just not going to work on TV very right. well. No, no, <laughs> when not. you, well, Sturgeon, you're not going to know who they are. They they pulled it off in Supernatural pretty well. But, oh, you know, I didn't watch enough of that show to know, but that's a, <laughs> but me, that's a good point. That they did, that, okay. You know, bring people back in a different body or whatever. Yeah. Or angels coming back in a different person's body. Hmm. But, so uh, they, they may do it, but I, I don't think it's going to happen as much. Mm -hmm. uh, I, don't, I don't think we can have as much of that. As, as, again, the storyline would get so confusing that you wouldn't know. So they may do it with one of the Forsaken. I don't think they'll do it with all of them, if, if they do it at all. Yeah. Uh, that may be how they trim it down is rather than, than having three or four of the Forsaken that show up two or three times and some others that are just kind of sidebars. You start with the 13, you, you kill off these two, and then here's someone else who, you know, it's just yeah. another Forsaken taking the place rather than one of the originals coming back. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's, it's just some thoughts, but there's some things they may have to do to trim the story down and keep it from being so confusing because it's it's difficult enough as it is yeah <laughs> if it were so straightforward there wouldn't be a fan community rereading this slowly and picking things apart right <laughs> exactly exactly well i think that's all i have for tonight all the the my, my nerd brain is tired yeah same i think i've uh i've kind of exhausted some of these topics <laughs> yes all right. Well, I hope you have a good evening. Yeah, you too. Bye. Oh, you didn't say it. Oh, <laughs> tell him bye, Giskel. Bye, Giskel. <laughs> bye. <laughs>